Well, tonight for our teaching time, uh, we're going to be looking uh, for the third time, uh, particularly at God's eternal decrees. Um, and uh, the last two Sundays, including this Sunday, uh, we've been talking about the doctrine of reprobation. Uh, now, that's a, a big word uh, that uh, I'm sure you all shared with your friends this week. Uh, you know, that's uh, now I did warn you last week about calling your friends a reprobate. That's probably not a good idea. However, when we think about the word reprobation, right, we need to, you know, remember that it's part of not just God's decree, but part of God's uh, blessings to the elect uh, that he has revealed to us uh, that everything that we have is by his grace and by his will and by his purpose. You know, even as we read in the book of Proverbs last week, even the wicked for the day of destruction. And so as we turn to our scripture reading today, we're going to go to Luke 9 and we're going to be reading uh, verses 23 uh, through 27. Now, in this part of, uh, uh, of the gospel of Luke, you know, Jesus is, uh, you know, he's just fed the 5,000. Uh, he's engaged in conversation with Peter about uh, who he is. Uh, he And right before the passage we look at, he has uh, prophesied of his death and resurrection. So that's kind of the situation we find ourselves here in Luke 9. So let's go ahead and read Luke 9, uh, starting there, verse 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death Till they see the kingdom of God. Amen. Now, you know, in my Bible, for reasons unknown to me, uh, the uh, you know the the folks who put together the Thompson Chain New King James uh, put a, a division there in, in between verses twenty six and twenty seven. Uh, but this is one continuous teaching uh, that the Lord Jesus has for us, and. As he is prophesying of the future, uh, he talks here at length in Luke 9 about discipleship, about the cost of taking up a cross and following after him. And one of the things he says in the midst of this in verse 26 is, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. So here we are told by Jesus that whatever is revealed in the Holy Scriptures is to be valued by the believer. Right? That there is no part of Scripture we can ignore. There's no part of Scripture we can look over. Right? There's no part of Scripture we are supposed to value more than any other part of Scripture. Uh, of course, that's ironic because, of course, in your Bible, what color are these words? Red, right? But... You know, yeah, I used to be a real, uh, you know, zealot about whether or not it was red or black. Um, but, you know, it is a little bit helpful, I guess, to, to, to know the, the, the direct place where Jesus is talking. But of course, if we were really doing it right, how much of the Bible would we make red letters? All of it, all of it right? The whole thing would be red letters because all of it is the Word of God, right? All of it is the Word of Christ and all of it is His testimony to us. As his children. And so one of the reasons why I chose this uh, passage to start us off tonight is that when we talk about the doctrine of reprobation, right, it can be very easy for us to try to, you know, soften the edges of the logic of reprobation, right? Uh, because as Paul deals with in Romans chapter 9, uh, is it unrighteous of God to not have mercy on Esau? No, right? Uh, even if we read that for the first time and think, boy, Esau got a raw deal. Uh, what do we see from the fruit of Esau's life? 
We do not see a man who is walking after the Lord, right? He might outwardly be doing the right things, right? We talked last week about how Esau was out hunting. He was out being a man, right? And, and what was Jacob largely doing? Hanging around his mom, right? <laughs> He's hanging around the house, right? And so in a worldly sense, uh, who would we say is being more, you know, consistent with, uh, you know, the witness of Scripture? Now, we might say Esau, right? Because he's fulfilling, you know, his role in the home, right? He's doing what he's supposed to. But, of course, what do we know of the children of Esau? Of, of the Edomites. That's right. They're enemies of God's people, right? So, is it unfair to the uh, Edomite who's hanging out there in the southern part of the promise, well, below the promised land in the book of Exodus when... You know, the Judahites, the descendants of, of Jacob, are coming up uh, to the land. You know, is it unfair of the Lord uh, for him to chastise the Edomites? No, right? And the reason for that is, is because when the people of God come to Edom, right, what are the Edomites supposed to do for their cousins, for their brothers? Well, they're supposed to help them out, right? They're supposed to provide for them. But what do the Edomites do when... The tribes uh, come up to their part of, uh, you know, the southern, uh, you know, little wastelands there below, uh, uh, below uh, Palestine. Right? They won't let them pass through, right? So we see the spirit of Esau in his descendants, right? We see something about the nature uh, of the work of God in Esau that is shown forth through those who descend from him by ordinary generation. Right, as the confession would call it. Now, you know, when we look at right the people of Jacob, right, you know, are the people of Jacob much better than the Edomites? <laughs> you know, uh, so the question is: is why are the Edomites chastised for acting like Esau uh, when the Israelites seem to, you know, at least outwardly, not seem to be that much better? That's right. They're the chosen people of God, right? That's what separates them from the Edomites, right? That they are the chosen seed. And of course, that goes all the way back, of course, to Genesis 3.15, right? The promise was the seed would come out of the line, right? And we're told that's, you know, and that's one of the reasons why those big genealogies exist at the beginning of Matthew and the beginning, or at the fourth chapter of the book of Luke, right? Is be, to show us that, it's not based on man and the work of man and the work of the flesh and the, the promise of the flesh that Christ has been born of a virgin in Bethlehem. Right? How did that come to pass? Right? By the decree of the living and true God. Right? By his being faithful to Israel from generation to generation. Right? It shows us that the decrees of God are not based upon the you know, sinful fickleness of humanity, right? It's based upon what God has decreed from before the foundation of the world. That's one of the things, again, we're meant to learn when we go read, like, you know, First and Second Chronicles, right? We read the big swaths of history of the Old Covenant, is that even when Israel was unfaithful, right, who was faithful? God was faithful, right? So... When we come again to talk about the doctrine of reprobation, right, we need to understand something again about the nature of our Lord, right? In Romans 9, right, it says that God will have mercy on who he will have mercy, right? And compassion on he, who he will have compassion. And, you know, there's a little bit of Deuteronomy 29, 29 that needs to come into play here, right? Um, is it for us to judge whether God is righteous in choosing one and not another. No, right? And why is it not just for us to make that uh, declaration? Because we're, we're not God, right? And one of the most important things in the Christian life, of course, is learning humility, right? And not just humility in a broad sense, but in a particular sense when it comes to the nature of the outward, outworking of God's decrees in history. So 
You know, one of the big questions, of course, that comes up when we talk about reprobation is why do some people not believe in Christ? Right, I mean, they they choose not to, right? You know, in, in a general sense, right? You know, they never, you know, if you want to use you know the Arminian term, right? They never make a decision for Christ, right? That's certainly the reason, right? But you know, Jesus gives us a little bit of an answer in what we read from Luke nine, right? You know, because they are ashamed of Him, right? They are ashamed of the living God. That's one of the reasons why they don't come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does it mean to be ashamed? Be embarrassed to be associated. Right, embarrassed to be associated, right? Yeah, and when it comes to being embarrassed in being associated with God, what 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 makes people embarrassed to be associated with God? It seems like you'd want to be associated with God, right? Because he made the heavens and the earth, right? He's the most powerful of all powerful beings, right? You know, even if you're to talk about it, right, in an earthly way, you know, you would rather be on Zeus's side, right, uh, than be on some random Greek dude's side, right? But, of course, the problem is, is if you're on Zeus's side, what can Zeus do to you? Right? He can destroy you, right? Because what do we know about Zeus? Right? He, he's a fickle guy, right? You, you don't know whether to trust Zeus, right? And that's, of course, one of the great differences between understanding God as he reveals himself in the scriptures and God as we would like him to be, right? You know, that's one of the reasons why people are ashamed of God, because they can't control God, right? They can't bend God to their own image, right? And that's really one of the, one, one of the, the, the direct reasons why people do not believe in Jesus right, is because, again, they refuse uh, to recognize that they are not God. You know, that's one of the things that Isaiah is trying to teach us in uh, Isaiah chapter 46 with the guy who cuts down the tree. You remember? And what does he do after he cuts down the tree? He makes a fire for himself, right, to warm himself and cook his dinner on. Um, and then after, after he's done eating dinner, what does he do with a piece of wood he finds laying around? Well, he, he whittles himself an idol, right? And, and then what does he do after he gets done whittling an idol? He bows down and worships it, right? Now, we're meant to see that, and we are meant to see the, the folly uh, of such a thing, right? Because what did that little wooden idol do? In order to deserve worship. Nothing, right? You know, who cut the tree down? He did, right? Who broke the tree down into smaller pieces? Who whittled the idol into the shape? He did, right? So who should be worshiping who? <laughs> the tree should be worshiping him, right? He gave it life in a sense, right? But again, that's the way idolatry works. And that's one of the reasons why idolatry is always really about the self, right? It's always really about, you know, making ourselves into a divine being. So the reason why people don't believe is because they're ashamed of the living God, right? They're embarrassed to be associated with him for whatever a reason that might be, right? Now, we have particular reasons why people are embarrassed or ashamed of the living God. You know, when um, you know when, when Paul uh, deals with unbelief in Romans chapter 1, right, you remember there is he's, he's talking about the nature of the uh, unbelief that uh, leads to destruction, right? He, he says to them that they're professing to be wise, they become fools. And, and why is that? Uh, because they did not know God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things, right? You know, that's, again, the nature of unbelief, right? That's why men and women do not come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Because they take what God has made, and they reduce it to a corruptible thing, right? They try to take 
incorruptible and make it corruptible. Because, you know, the language there isn't meaning that corruptible is, you know, sinful in the sense we mean that. What it means is it's, it's malleable, right? It's changeable into what they would like it to be. So, you, if you love a particular sin and I come to you and say, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, what decision are you going to have to make? That's right, whether to keep on sinning or turn away from whatever that sin is and rest in Jesus Christ. Right. You know, we, we see Jesus talk about this uh, a little later on in the ninth chapter of the book of Luke, right? When he talks about, when he runs into the three guys, right, who, who want to be followers, right? And, and each one of them has something in common, right? You know, Jesus says, come and follow me, and how do they respond? I gotta go bury my father, right? Or I have to go say goodbye to somebody, or I have to go do this. Well, is that the kind of discipleship that we're called to as believers? You know, go take care of something and then come follow me. Alright, that's not the kind of discipleship that Jesus is interested in, right? You know, Luke 9.62 says, when we put our hands to the plow, what are we not to do? Look back, right? And when we think about looking back, right, who's kind of the patron saint? Or I guess not patron saint, but who's the, uh, who's kind of the patron identity of people in the Bible who look back? Right? Lot's wife, right? And, and you remember the situation there, right? You know, God has redeemed them, right? He has provided for them. He has protected them. He's brought them out of the place of death, right? Out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they're walking up. And of course, what did God tell them not to do? Not to look back. And, of course, what does Lot's wife do? Looks back. Now, why does she look back? I mean, the Bible doesn't tell us why she looked back, right? There's not, she looked back because she thought she forgot something, right? It, you know, um, you know that, that's, the, that's the way we go on trips a lot up 161, right? Uh, <laughs> we get about up to Blaine's house up here on the corner uh, and realize we forgot something, right? So you got to turn around and go back, right? Well, that's not, of course, not what's going on with, with Lot's wife. What is she looking back to? The sin. The sin, right? She's looking back to Sodom. She's looking back to the city because where is her heart? Back in the city, right? However, when she looks back, you know, what is she seeing as she turns? Before she gets turned into a pillar of salt, what is she seeing? Destruction. Now, does she know that there's destruction going on in Sodom? Absolutely, right? Because God had told them he would destroy the city, right? And so she looks back at destruction because what she, would she rather have? Destruction, right? She would rather have, be burned alive in the city of Sodom than put her hand to the plow and not look back. Now, of course, it's not accidental. Of course, nothing's accidental in the Bible, but you know, it's accidental. What did she turn into? Pillar of salt, right? And in the Old Testament, you know, what, what does salt signify? You know, it, you know, you mixed it with things to preserve, right? And it was also a testimony to the, to, to the certainty of God's promise, right? That, that's what Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount when he talks about the salt, right? Losing its flavor and all that, right? Because what happens to God's salt? Right? It never loses its flavor, right? It never stops preserving us, right? But, you know, if it, you know, what, if, if salt loses its flavor, it loses its saltiness, right? What's it worth doing? Throwing out and trampling over, right? Because it doesn't serve its purpose. Well, so when we talk about reprobation, right, we ask that question, why do some people not believe in Christ? Well, it's again because they, again, love the things of the world more than they love the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why did you come to faith? <laughs> right, because as Ephesians chapter 1 says, right, you were chosen for the foundation of the world, right, to bear the righteousness of Christ, right, to, to be part of, of God's covenant people. Right, and so, you know, are you a believer because you just believed harder uh, than Lot's wife? No, right? You're not a believer just because you, you know, God caught you on a good day and you were ready. Uh, you were prepared that day. 
to follow Christ. Now, in a sense, though, right, we were prepared to follow Christ. All right? You know, one of the things that's important to remember about, you know, about those who are saved by grace is what is the Holy Spirit doing uh, before we come to faith? It makes us alive, right? And one of the things he's doing too is, you know, you think of the, the parable of the sower, right? One of the things the Holy Spirit's doing, right, is he's he, he's taking our heart, right, and he's putting that furrow in, right? He's getting dirt, right, the rocks away, getting all the stuff together, right, making sure the soil's the right pH, all that good stuff, right? So when the word is preached and the seed falls, what's the seed going to do? going to grow, right? That's one of the things the Holy Spirit does for the elect, right? He removes all the briars, he removes all the the, the, the rocks, everything, so that it's in good soil when the when you know the seed falls in there. But for the reprobate, you know, one of the things that does not happen to them is they are not prepared by the work of the Holy Spirit to receive the testimony of truth. Um, so they, now there are times, of course, where the reprobate appear to have faith. All right. We have plenty of examples of that in the Old and New Testament where somebody strives with Christ for a season. All right. And then, you know, what, what usually happens, uh, when, when they fall away? All right. You, the, what's that? They love the world, love the world right? You, you think of, of Alexander the coppersmith, right? You think of Janus and John Bray. You know, you think of, um, oh goodness, the other fellow that Paul talks about. Um, not Alexander the coppersmith, the other guy. What's that? Well, Simon the magician, yeah, in the book of Acts, you know, he's a good example of that. There's somebody else that he mentions in the letter to Timothy, and I can't think of the name right now. But that's, he says there explicitly, right? He, he, he's done me much harm, he, he has loved the present evil world, right? You know, there is something in them that does not give up that attachment to the world, right? And so one of the things we're told is, is that those who are not elect, one of the things they will not do is they will not persevere in the faith, right? You know, we spent a lot of time last spring going over Tulip, right? And that's the, the fifth one of Tulip, right? Perseverance of the saints. And when we think about perseverance, um, you know, one of the things we always need to remember about, and one of the things that is dangerous sometimes, people mess this up, is, you know, we don't get in by grace and stay in by works, right? Because if that was the arrangement, if we got in by grace, let's say God elects everybody and elects everybody to faith, and then it's up to us to complete the deal, Right? Uh, you know, we, we get, you know, a washing of sin, we get a clean slate, however you want to say that. Um, we get returned back to Adam's situation in the garden. Uh, how long would we last? About as long as Adam did in the garden, right? Uh, and, and why would that happen? We're sinners. Because we're sinners, right? And so, you know, ultimately what separates the elect from the reprobate is the doctrine of, pres uh, of, of perseverance. You know, is this idea, is the concept that we are, we, we come in by grace, we stay in by grace, and we are completed by grace, right? It's all of God. Everything that happens in our life is of the Lord. Uh, and, and, you know, some, uh, one of the things I'll get a question about every now and then, uh, somebody will ask, one of the things that somebody asks me about all the time, one of them is, is if I've committed the par unpardonable sin. Uh, and I always comfort people by saying, if you think you committed the unpardonable sin, you didn't. Right? Because if you commit the unpardonable sin, are you going to be worried about it? No. no. <laughs> right? So, you know, that's, it's a good sign. Right? Conviction of sin is always a good thing. Right? It's a, it's a sign that the Lord's working in your heart. But the other thing people ask me about is, you know, I've, you know, I came to faith when I was a young child or a young man. I'm 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, and I just don't feel the fire of that initial conversion anymore. And, you know, you, what do I do about that? Does that mean I'm reprobate? Does that mean I've lost my place in the kingdom if I don't feel 
you know, as alive as I once did. Yeah, and I mean, if somebody asked you that, how, how would you respond to that? About the same way, if you're not concerned about it, then, then you know you're not. Uh, you probably have it. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, again, it's one of those signs where you know, we're, anxiousness isn't always a bad thing, right? Uh, there's a difference, of course, between being anxious as the world's anxious and being anxious as the believer's anxious, right? You know, one of the things the Lord does for us sometimes, right, is he pushes a little button in us that causes us to think about something, right? And so if you're, if you're concerned about that, right, you know, it's certainly something to be concerned about, right? But do, do we stop with the concern? Right? How, how do we, you know, relight the fire, if you want to put it that way? Right, because you know we're not Pentecostal. We don't believe in second blessing and all that kind of stuff, right? But you know, how do we relight? How do we go about relighting the fire? Go back to the scriptures, right? You know, when whenever there is a time of you know depression is too strong a word, but you know, it, 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 whenever there's a time in our Christian life where we're kind of on the downward slope of, of something, right? The the answer to that downward slope is to, you know, remember how we got up the slope to begin with, right? You know, any of y'all ever done much snow skiing? Uh, you, 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 you know, one of the nice things about snowshoe mountain skiers where I worked when I was a kid, or in, in high school, I wasn't a kid. <laughs> we had child labor laws in West Virginia. But the, when I was in high school was is that everything was on top of the mountain, right? So you skied down the mountain and then rode the... Uh, you know, the stuff back up the mountain. At most ski resorts, right, everything's at the bottom and you ride the thing up to the top and then, you know, ski down. Well, you know, one of the things that we need to remember when we think about, again, this weakness of faith or this lack of fire that we have is, again, everything that we do in the Christian life has to be, um, you know, has to be kind of brought together in the understanding of how we got to be a believer to begin with. Right? You know, if we testify as we do that you get in by grace and stay in by grace and you are completed by grace, uh, then if we are feeling weak, right, we should be reminded, as Paul's reminded in 2 Corinthians 12, that my grace is sufficient for thee. Right? So we, we cry out to the Lord, you know, in our time of weakness. And what's the promise we have in the scriptures? He will hear our cries, right? How many times in the Psalms? Do we hear David say, you know, I, my heart is disquieted within me in some kind of way, right? And, and how is his heart uh, quieted? Right? By remembering the providences of God in his life, remembering that God has established him in his faith and brought him into these things. So we're, we're kind of close on this, but... You know, one of the things when we talk about the doctrine of reprobation, right, that, that is central to it is understanding, again, the difference between the elect and the reprobate, ultimately. And it is grounded in the, the doctrine of perseverance, right? We make it to the end. Right? The elect make it to uh, the end of the race, right? Where the reprobate either never get in the race or they don't finish the race. Right? There's usually something that happens which draws them away. And it goes back, you know, it's what we read there in Romans, uh, in, in, in Luke 9, right? They're ashamed, you know, of God in some way. And we'll go ahead and close on that, but any questions or comments or anything? All right, well, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Great Heavenly Father, we give thanks again uh, for tonight as we uh, study uh, the, these things and as we think upon them to God, we ask that you would Bless us and strengthen us and guide us that we might learn more of your kingdom and of our place in it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, our benediction tonight comes to us from Matthew 11. Uh, again, we read this uh, well-known passage, which uh, yeah, certainly applies to what we've uh, spoken of tonight. Again, Matthew 11, beginning there at verse 28. Hear the word of God. Come to me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. To my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen.